Please join me, everyone, in welcoming Clark Carlisle. Um, you know, my name is Clark Carlisle, and I'm not just some arbitrarily selected Z-list footballer. You know, I'm a specifically requested Z-list footballer <laughs> uh, for hopefully reasons that will become apparent. Um, in order for me to, to talk to you guys, I've got to say initially what an honour it is to come here and join in the, the conference and contribute to this and the fact that you will hopefully find my contribution worthwhile. Um, before I go into the reasons why I, I do talk so openly and uh, I do campaign as vociferously as I do about mental health, you, you're going to need to know a little bit more about my journey. You know, I was born in Preston, uh, third child of four, so a family had very little money, no money, dad never had a job. Uh, they, they did instill us with fantastic values though, you know, we, we were taught that you didn't need money for a loving household, you didn't need money for a clean household, you didn't need money to, to learn manners and respect. You know, they're fantastic values that I instill in my children now. But what, what they also sowed into us was the fact that if you work hard and you're dedicated, that anything is possible for you. I got called up for England under 21s. You know, it was the proudest moment of my life to that date to go to the Riverside Stadium and pull on the Three Lions shirt. I was having a fantastic time. Then one game, a QPR against Fulham at home, Tuesday night match, we were ground sharing at the time actually, and as a tackle with Rufus Brevet. Innocuous tackle, we both went for the same ball, but my, my uh, leg hyperextended and I ruptured my ACL, my LCL, popped the TS, ITB, um, rotated the fibula head, dislodged the nerve and ripped the hamstring off, um, off the bone. Quite a comprehensive knee injury. So much so that the surgeon said to me at the time that, uh, Clark, I'm not sure that you're going to be able to walk without a stick again. I got into a, a terrible, terrible state. And what happens when you're isolated? What happens when you have no one to talk to? What, you, what happens when you have no objectivity, no balance to what's going through your, through your mind? What happens when you think your world is torn apart, that your identity has totally been obliterated and that you are now of worth and value to no one and nothing? So you go to a very dark place. And I decided that I didn't want to run away. I didn't want to escape. I decided that the world would be better off without me. There is the beginning of my journey with depression. Now, it wasn't the fact that I was injured. It wasn't the fact that I tried to commit suicide. It was the fact that I failed. It was the fact that afterwards, my football club said, right, you got away with that, we'll not talk about that, let's pretend that never happened. I didn't even tell my side of the family, didn't tell them at all. And I read through this list and I thought, that's me, that's me. That's me, that's me, that's me. Gem, I, I've not had a baby. <laughs> and there was my epiphany. I, I saw this checklist and it, it hit me like a sledgehammer. I went to my club doctor at the time. I said, Doc, I've been reading through this list uh, for postnatal depression. I've not had a baby, but they're, they're all describing me. He said, well, you've got depression. He said it so matter-of-factly. I said, what do you mean I've got depression? How can I have depression? From there, I got my medication. I started to do some intense counselling, and that's how I can work my backstory. I know. There were periods of time where I just would not pick up my phone, wouldn't answer emails, I wouldn't do anything. I just locked myself off from the world. At football, there was nothing in place. There was no one to help and guide me at the time of my suicide attempt. There was no one other than the, my GP to help and guide me when I had my depression diagnosed. And having raised my own awareness, I saw in and around me a lot of other guys who were feeling or representing similar things to how I felt. And that, you know, kind of flicked a switch for me. I thought, I bet there are loads of lads 
who feel like I do. I, but I saw this, I saw glimpses of this in a lot of people and that's what prompted me to present the documentary on depression and on suicide and the, the film that was produced was incredibly personal although that wasn't the intention because there are still so many people who are either not living in denial but living in ignorance they don't know what's going on you can't afford to have the medically qualified in every workforce those that can afford it should and should implement an independent support network so that if your employees need to go to that, they don't feel that they will be marginalised, they don't feel that they will be judged or tested, or that it will impact on their work prospects. Quite, quite a specific danger in football, because the machismo, the alpha male, doesn't want to show any sign of perceived weakness. And depression and mental health issues are still perceived as personal weakness. Morning, Clarkie. After a month, I knew the morning greetings of every individual, every individual. And you start to spot someone who's, you know, not quite with it, heads down, don't want to give you the hug when normally they give you a hug. So a bit later in the session, when I was around about, I said, hey, hey, B, uh, how are you today? You all right? He's like, oh, no, not really, Clarky. Oh, we'll have a coffee later. Let's have a chat later. Yeah, all right, cheers. His performance level shifted from that point onwards in the training session. I've never had so many coffees in all my life. <laughs> never. Honestly, it's just almost classic substitution, alcohol for coffee. But it was for a purpose. It was for a purpose. When I was filming the documentary, I was going back to the site where I tried to commit suicide. I was, uh, I was incredibly nervous about it, incredibly nervous. And I rang Jen beforehand and I said, look, love, I'm going back to Acton. Okay. What are you worried about? I said, I don't know. So what's going to happen? I said, I don't know, but that's what I want to tell you. I'm just worried that something might happen, and I want us both to be prepared for it. I went there, utterly capitulated emotionally, left joyous at the fact that I was unsuccessful 13 years ago. And I've 13 years of life and experience and of a wife and three beautiful children to enjoy and to share. So in, in summary, I think it's really vitally important that we understand mental health, that we understand the signs and symptoms. As an employer, if you don't understand them personally, you need to have someone on your staff who does. When you're dealing with a mental, someone who's suffering some kind of mental health illness, don't be patronising. They're just a human being who has an illness just like they might have a broken leg or gastroenteritis. It's not, oh, how are you today, Clark? It's Clark, you're right today. Do you know what? Yeah, actually, today I'm fine. But make sure you have the support mechanisms in place that give them the freedom, that give them the comfort, give them the security to know that they can go there, they will get the support that they need, and when they leave there, they're still a valued member of the workforce. And thank you for listening. I hope you take something from it.